Hello, everybody. I think we're going to start. Thanks for everybody who has been so prompt starting at 12 uh, for wherever you are on this planet. And just as a reminder, we will be recording this. So um, uh, there will be things we can share on YouTube later on. My name is Jonathan Brecken. I'm your chair for the next 90 minutes to this event. How can we make lived experience a genuine part of evidence informed policy? Um, I'm going to briefly introduce the speakers and, and outline what I'm hoping we're going to cover over the next 90 minutes. Uh, but just to let you know, Transforming Evidence is a, is a community that hopefully many of you are members of, but if not, we'll be sending you an invite. It's for everybody who wants to share research and expertise about how evidence is made and used, but across different policy and practice domains. And that's something we're very interested in today. What can we learn from different policy areas, lived experience, certainly my perspective, and, and feel free to disagree in the chat function. I think there's been a lot in health, but I think there's so much we can learn and apply in different policy and practice areas. So um, I'm a senior associate at Transforming Evidence, and um, I'm going to be handing over to Annette Boaz in a moment, who's a co-director of Transforming Evidence, who will frame things. But uh, before I do, I want to just highlight what I would uh, really love us to cover in the next 90 minutes. And we've got 315 people registered, so I know it's going to be hard to get through uh, everybody's questions, but we'll do our best. And maybe there's some things we can follow up on afterwards uh, if we don't get to your questions in, in the chat function. But the key question here is exactly as that title. There seems to be so much good practice at the local level, particularly around health. How do we get lived experience an authentic part of the policy making process? Uh, and I had somebody on, on Friday from the Welsh government say how often they saw lived experience in uh, the Welsh Parliament, the Senate, as separate to research evidence. It came in in different forms and it seemed to inhabit different worlds. How can we bring those two worlds of lived experience and policy together? In addition, how can we make sure it's not tokenistic? I'm sure we've all had experiences of bad practice, of not being genuine in our engagement and lived experience. So I'd love to hear the speaker's views on that. And then finally, what sort of skills, capacities and resources do we need to make this a reality? Skills and capacities both for researchers, but maybe, it, maybe it's others. Now, a bit of uh, housekeeping here. We are, as I mentioned, recording this. Uh, we will anonymize any faces. Uh, it's primarily about the speaker's talks. I will be verbalizing some questions in the chat function. Uh, so you won't be giving your questions uh, face to face. Please do give questions that are short and pithy. If they're long essays, maybe just make them as a comment. I'm not going to be able to read very long questions and concentrate on the speakers and what other people are saying. So if you have questions in the chat function, please do it in a, a very pithy way. That would be helpful. Just one other things to, to flag up. We have uh, an extraordinary diver diversity of different people here from outside of the UK, from different policy areas, from government, NGOs, universities, and others. So please try and avoid any jargon or acronyms so that we can be inclusive. Yeah, anything that might feel like so obvious, like, I don't know, the NHS, it's not obvious to others. So please avoid any 
acronyms and jargon just have in the back of your head we're going to have uh, lots of people from different geographies and policy areas so with that i'm going to just briefly introduce the speakers and then i'm going to hand over to annette to do a few minutes of framing of this question as i mentioned i'm really keen that we get this different take on lived experience so i'm delighted we have patrick Ockwin from cameroon from effective basic services who i think will give a great insight in what we can learn from engaging with indigenous knowledge from their involvement in spaces outside of health and education and other basic services and indeed in what we label international development generally i think there's so much we can learn when we're thinking about applying lived experience in other fields we're then going to hand over to Lynn Laidlaw, who's going to speak for, for 10 minutes. Everyone will be in 10 minutes. And apology speakers, I'm going to be quite ruthless on that 10 minutes so that our audience gets a chance to answer, ask you questions. But I'm delighted Lynn's here, who has so much experience as a patient and public contributor and a peer researcher. She's independent, but she's worked with lots of different organizations. So I think that vital personal experience of this space uh really looking forward to hearing her stories and take on this and then finally we're going to hear from kerry davies from natsen which is uh, a really important international uh but uk uh, independent research organization and what's really vital about her take on this is those techniques on deliberative democracy what can we learn from deliberative democracy specifically on lived experience not just opening it up to other audiences and also in that policy space our challenge for today so those are our speakers but before we get going i'm going to hand over to annette barres who is the co-director of transforming evidence annette over to you thanks jonathan um and that was a really comprehensive introduction um, just to reiterate, um, a big thank you um, for coming from myself and Catherine Oliver, who co direct Transforming Evidence, and to highlight for you um, Transforming Evidence online resources. So we've got some great things there in terms of lots of podcasts, things you might want to read, um, and also the YouTube channel where there's a great series we did on intermediaries and also on systems if those are areas of your interest. Uh, uh, sort of sitting around the transforming evidence work is our concern that essentially we reinvent the wheel and we don't learn. And so what we want to do today is do some learning from different perspectives from our fantastic speakers to help us think about bringing lived experience into the evidence and policy debate where it really isn't part of how we talk about the use of evidence. And um, I guess the question in my mind is what is different about thinking about evidence for policy? Or are the issues that have been worked through by Lynn and colleagues in the UK and by others elsewhere around, you know, how do we value lived experience? How do we resource it properly and support it? How do we build meaningful partnerships between different actors and collaborators? How do we address power in inequities? How do we reconcile different perspectives and different sources of evidence and knowledge? Are these the same perennial questions we'll bring to thinking about evidence and policy if we bring in lived experience or and are there different and, and additional issues as well. So i'm really looking forward to hearing from the speakers today and also your questions, um, and I think we've hopefully we've got time to have a really rich start, as Jonathan said, of a discussion in this area and fill out a very important gap that we've identified in the transforming evidence landscape. So that's all from me and really looking forward to hearing from the speakers. Fantastic. Thanks, Annette. Um, Patrick, over to you. I know you've got some slides and we'll we'll help talk you talk those through. You're on mute, Patrick. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Jonathan, for the great introduction and uh, for having me here to speak. Um, so I'll be happy to have my slides up now. And thank you very much for the audience who've made up time from their busy schedules to attend this. And I can promise you it will be very useful for you moving forward. So today I'll be talking about lived experiences with evidence mobilization in middle Africa and specifically uh, my experiences in the trenches of an experimental society. 
we always start by sharing the color knot. Uh, what you see on my opening slide there is a color knot. It's in Africa, it's a sign of peace, wisdom, and sharing. So we always want to have this once we, when we are having our slides. I'm Patrick Oquen, and I'm the team lead at eBay's. Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, today, uh, briefly, we will talk about how we connect to the world, how we use these con connections, uh, how we ensure family fairness and equity, and how we mobilize data in the ecosystem within the context of um, uh, within the context of our lived experiences, meaning that we'll be drawing from our international networks and connections and our local connections and our experiences across all of these and trying to highlight to you why in middle Africa this is particularly very important. Thanks all. So um, context really matters. This is something that we take quite seriously. Uh, I think uh, during the introduction it was highlighted how Sometimes we do a lot of work and then we reinvent the wheel and then, uh, but generally uh, there is need to think about context because when you think about context, that is actually when you get to identify research that you don't need to do anymore because it's been done in another context and this data can be available open source because most funders insist now that data should be open source. So if we look at the picture, evidence is mostly generated from uh, high income countries in the north and then implemented in the global south uh, most times. Uh, evidence use is used both in the north and in the south. But what we have to realize is the difference in the in the in the dif in, in, in the in the context. Uh, now the difference in the context is very important, but from our experience the similarities are much, much more than the differences. It's just that the differences could be quite disruptive. And if we don't uh, actively take this into consideration, actively reflect on this, actively get uh, consumers in the context where we want to implement evidence to react on the outcomes that are coming from the evidence from a different context, it becomes very challenging. Because you can imagine the picture there is from Adelaide. We've done a lot of work with uh, jo Joanna Briggs Institute, done a, work, a lot of work with Educational Ed Endowment Foundation. And this evidence is to be transposed from the high income countries with such beautiful buildings, such order, to smaller uh, context. Even though we also have this kind of order and big buildings in Africa, but you also still have rural areas that make the bulk of, uh, of, of the areas where we implement uh, our, our research evidence. So it's important to notice that some of this needs, these connections need to be done for adequate contextualization to happen. Thanks all. Now, uh, now I would first of all want us to talk about my experiences with uh, global evidence meetings globally. I participate in a lot of these meetings, and this includes the Cochrane uh, Colloquium, the What Works Global Summit with the Campbell Collaboration, the Africa in Daba, which is a local evidence mobilization for Africa conference uh, links to Cochrane, the Africa Evidence, the JBI Colloquium, the EA, EEF Annual Meetings, and Guidelines International Network. And I must say that these are very, very important live lines for uh, implementing evidence in, uh, in, in Africa because they provide you with opportunities to network, to, uh, to connect with people who are interested in working in Africa, who have um, experiences you can tap in from, capacities you can tap in from, resources that you can also tap in from, including human and financial resources. So for example, one of our biggest funders, which is EEF, uh, Education Endowment Network in the UK, we actually made a connection at an African Evidence Network in, uh, uh, in, in South Africa. And one of our biggest human resources partners that happens to be JBI, uh, we made this connection with at a Guidelines International Network uh, in, in, in Australia. So it's important to highlight that to be able to successfully work in Africa, we need this kind of meetings. Thanks so. And apart from the meetings, while we are in these meetings, these networks have to be able to connect. So the, 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 the delegates have to be aware of the fact that there is an opportunity to connect and that this connection could be lifelines 
access to human resources and financial resources. And the networks that we've really found really useful in the past include the guidelines international, uh, the guidelines evident net networks, the African evidence networks. Uh, the guidelines international network is with the gene. That's the guidelines international uh, network. Lots of evidence uh, or recommendations or guidelines makers are always present. And then the Africa Canada Artificial Intelligence and Digital Health Consortium, which brings together. Uh, um, artificial intelligence experts from Canada and connect them with those in Africa to facilitate the work that we do. Since we don't have, uh, we may not have as many intellectuals as we would want. Slide, please. Now, there is also the importance to think about uh, a call to action. Now, we have also been involved in a lot of global evidence days. Now, it may be, it may, you may find it curious, like of what importance is this? But trust me, in Africa, these days are really, really useful because it awakens the policymakers on the need to engage in uh, or to stop and think about a problem that may be staring them in the face and they have never really given thought to it. They are able to give time off their work and sit and reflect with citizens around what is the importance of, for example, an evidence-based healthcare day. So e eBase has been actively uh, has been active with other global partners in many calls to action, and this includes the International Evidence-Based Healthcare Day, the International Day of Menstruation, and we are actually working at the moment, leading and championing on an international day for evidence in education, and uh, we will share a, a link if you are interested in being part of this group to set up this International Day of Evidence in Education. We are always looking for international uh, partners to work with us on this. And then also removing language barriers to data. Now, one thing we have also uh, discovered is that uh, there is a lot of research that's done in African context. The ethics committees will insist that they would want to see uh, that the consent forms are in the local languages, or there's, there's an approach to get the consent form to the, the people in the local languages. However, they fail to uh, bridge the final gap of disseminating the evidence to the people in local languages. So uh, global evidence days and calls to action that we are working at at eBase is to ensure that this can actually happen. Thanks all. Next slide. And uh, here we have some pictures of how we have really worked in the trenches of this experimental society, getting connections with ministers, with the research agencies in Africa that are relevant to moving things forward uh, in boot camps for impact evaluators, etc. This is this is the area where we work in. And I could talk about this for an hour, but I'll just briefly mention the countries where we are actively uh, mobilizing, getting ministries, getting researchers on board with evidence. Here you can see that we are discussing with the Minister of Education, Secondary Education in Cameroon, uh, Professor Nalova. She's been a big champion. And one thing we realized is that for you to get to government, you need to find someone who has interest. So the minister has been able to take us and move into the other government houses and, in, and say that I have come with someone who has good news. Please listen to them. So she has done this, taken time off her busy schedule to push us to work with uh, government officials for them to better understand exactly what is evidence-informed decision-making and how they could get involved in working with us. We also have had meetings in Senegal. The second picture on the right is a picture with the meeting of um, Professor Mboup, who was very instrumental in identifying HIV-2, um, which was really prevalent in West Africa and which was not known to the rest of the world. And key personalities like these sometimes do not realize the fact that you need to actively get the research evidence to the practitioners and that uh, there exist mechanisms that you can get this to them very easily. So we have, to, we have to mobilize these kind of key personalities across Africa to let them know that the evidence trains goes beyond just conducting the research, but conducting the research and making sure that you make it available to policymakers, to practitioners, and to the general public. And we also have the first picture on the left bottom there is a picture which we had at the boot camp in Benin Republic in West Africa with young people. So we get young people to let them know the importance of evaluating uh, their interventions correctly 
and then we 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 stay with them for about two weeks, and we use locally made software and artificial intelligence to help them to develop or to evaluate their 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 interventions, because getting the ones from outside are really expensive, and we can get open source for them that are designed codes that are designed by by local actors. Thanks all. Next slide. So. Um, here of research, how do we go across it? We take a process, and uh, this process is a process that we built uh, together with the Education Endowment Foundation. And I give here an example from one of the projects that we have done. So the first step is, once we identify an innovation, we evaluate the, the impact. In this case, it was a storytelling uh, um, uh, intervention. And this storytelling intervention had, had actually been uh, uh, um, initially supported by Education and Endowment Foundation. Then it got a seed funding from the, from the French embassy in Cameroon to develop the context. So once we develop the context, we now got funding from Grand Challenges Canada. And also can, we, we also had another funding from Canadian Institute of Research uh, together with McMaster University to, con to conduct a small number of, in a small number of communities, programs exploring uh, the acceptability and the feasibility of storytelling. For this particular uh, approach, we are still at the stage of skill, and it's quite challenging getting money for skill because there's a lot of competition. From our experience, the, 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 the field is not fair. The field is not uh, level, especially when you are bringing an intervention from the Global South. Someone leading from the Global South is at lower chances of winning uh, comparing with a university in London that's submitting a project to run in Africa for a trial. And uh, this is understandable because they have more resources to write uh, 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 proposals. I will have to write proposals, do the report. We don't have that resources to expand, to expand that much. Then they have a lot of experiences, so they could just take a template and redesign it for that one and they beat the case. And then they also have, there are several, we could talk about the differences that make it difficult for us to be able to compete in this setting. Despite the fact that we have really, really good concepts developed <clears throat> that really respond very well to our context, but we cannot communicate this on a fair field to the funders to get the money. However, our experience shows that once we have uh, results of effectiveness, efficacy, acceptability, government buy-in is usually very easy. And we have other techniques to make sure that we get to government, including setting up partnerships. We have a partnership with the government, which we have committed to pick up interventions that are, are actually effective and that answers to their questions. Uh, thanks, all. Next slide. And I'm curious to know how I'm doing on yes, time. Yes, actually, we'll, that's 10 minutes. So just another 30 seconds or so, would that be OK? Okay, that'll be okay. So um, uh, research needs to respond to Africa's questions. It needs to be southern led. It needs to be funded adequately and fairly uh, ethical, both for researchers and participants. It has to be rigorous and can that can so much so that that can compete with global standards. And here I also to the right give some examples of some of the research that we are currently doing with some partners moving forward. Slide please. And it's the same things with the innovations. Wicked problems calls for adaptive learning, and we can do this while we are on the ground. We've done this with a lot of uh, examples, which are also listed on the right. And best practice needs to be more efficient uh, within the evidence ecosystem, highlighting the fact that we can use research from the north. Uh, we just need to adapt, contextualize, and in some cases, we even just adopt because the similarities are more than the differences. Slide this. Um, so the challenges we have include capacities, and this can be fixed by networks, collaborations, and innovations. And webinars like this contribute to the opportunities for us to find networks, to collaborate, for people to have a cool head to look at what we are doing and then connect with us. Funding is also an issue. Again, collaborations still come on board. Publications is something which we also find really challenging, being able to publish in journals that are mostly controlled by the Global North. Because if I cite a policy from Cameroon, an editor who is maybe based in London is more likely to tell me that it's not relevant for the rest of the world. But if I cite the policy from the UK, that is okay, even if it doesn't cover. So these kind of things come in. And then also travels, there are issues around uh, visa acquisition, cost of traveling, and collaborations and funding and adaptivity could really help. Slide, please. So these are some of our partners. Slide, please and uh, our contacts. We have a Twitter handle there. We are very active on Twitter. 
you can see almost all the work we do on Twitter, slide please. And thank you. That's all I have for today. Sorry for the extra time. Thank you so much, Patrick. Yeah, and it really hammers home the importance of networks and partnerships uh, as a vital part of this work. And thank you for some of those sort of practical tips, like things like ethics committees and what we can do with them, but building capacity funding uh, and help for things like publications and travels. It's a really good challenge. And I'm really keen that we think about the practicalities of some of these things. So um, I'm going to pass over to, to Lynn now. And Lynn, I'd love to get your personal take on, on this. And, um, and whether you think this challenge is even the right challenge of getting into policy. Thank you. Um, let, let me just. So hi, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to present at this event. And I want to start by explaining my context and my interest in this topic. So I live with multiple health conditions, including a rare disease. And as a result, I became involved in what we call in the United Kingdom patient and public involvement. But I know that different terms are used across the world. And patient and public involvement is defined as doing research with the people affected, not for them. And in the past two years, I've had the privilege to co-produce research and work as a peer researcher, and I have no formal research training. And co-production is an approach to working together in equal partnership and for equal benefit, involving patients and members of the public as full members of teams. So when I spoke to Jonathan before the event, he mentioned that people would be attending from across the globe and that this event would be concerned with all types of policy making. So I understand that my personal context is health, but I would argue that the values and principles underlining the involvement of lived experience are the same, regardless of the policy context. So I was involved in co-producing the values of the Co-Production Collective, who are based at University College London. And the values that we felt our community were important, were, were challenging ourselves and each other, being human, being inclusive and transparent in everything we do. And of course, other values are available, but I would say that it's really important to collectively decide at a team what values are important to you from the start of any project. And I suspect that the issues in involving lived experience are the same too, regardless of the context in which you operate. And the issues that I have personally come up against are the issues of power, culture, emotions, and tension. So what I'm about to say is a personal reflexive account. I'm not representative of all lived experience, but I hope that you can relate to some of the issues that I'm going to talk about. And one thing that I do want to highlight from the start is the importance of reflexivity. It's not just for qualitative research. Essentially, reflexive practice is acknowledging your prior assumptions, experiences and beliefs, and recognizing how they may impact on how you feel about involving people in public policy. So in the event description we were all sent, one of the questions posed was, what skills, capacities and experiences do researchers need in order to work with people of diverse types of lived experience? And that's a really important question, but I want to turn it around and ask, what do the people with lived experience need in order to be a genuine part of evidence-informed policy? So being involved in co-producing a research project into shielding, I had to shield in the pandemic, um, which we hoped would impact policy, and also in policy work that I've done with the Academy of Medical Sciences in the United Kingdom was hugely challenging to me, as well as providing me with the most wonderful opportunities. So I had to overcome imposter syndrome, and I know that imposter syndrome affects most of us, because nothing in my previous life had prepared me for these experiences. And it also led to a bit of an identity crisis. Who was I, a researcher or a person with lived experience? Could I be both? Did one negate the other? How much of our identity is caught up in how others perceive us? Is it helpful to define people by their lived experience? And does this create a them and us situation? 
do the people that you choose to involve have to be a bit like Goldilocks porridge and just right, without any say in what right is in this context? Who decides what policy areas and decisions people will bec become involved with? Is it all decided beforehand? Involving people with lived experience in an ethical and equitable way requires time and resources. People aren't free goods. We need to offer remuneration to people for their time and effort, and it is of course up to them whether they choose to accept it. And I feel this is important if we want to be inclusive and ensure diversity. Otherwise, the only people who can become involved are those who can afford to, um, to, to give you their time and their effort. And if we genuinely want to involve people in policy, we need to devote resources and time to this. Ask people what they need to enable them to become involved. And I wonder, is this another situation where everyone wants to involve people with lived experience, but actually no one wants to pay to resource it or, or, or to give the time that it, that it requires? And, and I want to touch a bit on, on culture and ask, does your organisation have a culture that values and acknowledges different types of knowledge? Because this is what this is about. Um, you know, why does your organisation want to involve people with lived experience? Is it to tick a box or because you would genuinely believe that it will add value? And the phrase culture eats strategy for breakfast springs to mind. Co-production of research and policy can interfere with everyone's identity. Have you thought about how it might interfere with academic and professional identity with people in your organisation? And I have shared Annette's blog, Lost in Co-Production, which I'll post in the chat afterwards with multiple people, as it very much resonates with my experiences and the tensions when there is disagreement about the outputs from research and policy, such as publishing taking priority over the needs of people. And I think we need to ask, what constitutes lived experience and what type is valid? And I find myself endlessly pushing back at the zombie idea that people with lived experience come with an agenda, are too emotional, are only interested in their own lived experience and can't see beyond that. And I think that's a ludicrous assumption that it's only people with lived experience that are the ones with an agenda in policy or research. And as I mentioned earlier, this is why reflexivity for all involved is so important. And this overlaps to a certain extent with the notion of representativeness. Are people with lived experience held to a higher standard of representatives than researchers and policymakers? Do I need to be representative of all people with lived experience? But if you were talking to a researcher, would you expect them to be representative of all researchers? And I think there are some important debates to be had about what type of experience is necessary and whether it's dependent on the context. For myself, I didn't get it till I got it. I was a nurse and thought I understood what it was like to be a patient and live with multiple conditions because I nurse patients with multiple conditions every day. It took me becoming unwell to recognise that I didn't know. And I wonder who gets to decide who to involve and what criteria are important. And yes, people with lived experience get emotional, but it's the emotion that drives us to become involved. We genuinely want to make a difference. And I would say that no one will care about your research or policy more than the people directly affected by it. And I also wonder if we need to ask some questions about the rise in deliberative democracy and, to the, and the extent to which it actually informs policy decisions. And is it actually a type of performative democracy? Because what power do participants have over whether the findings influence policy? Is there rollover at the end of the citizen's jury or similar? How are the sessions set up? Who are the experts that are invited to speak to juries? Who sets the questions to be asked? Who analyzes the conversations? And, and crucially, who writes the, who writes the, the report? So, as usual, I find myself with more questions th than answers. And, you know, I, I'm sorry if it feels a bit weird that I've asked all these questions rather than giving you a load of answers. And the phrase, it ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it, springs to mind. You can make lived experience a genuine part of evidence informed policy. Right. 
and I have been involved in projects that have done so. But it can also become a tick box virtue signaling exercise that has the potential to cause emotional and other harm to all the people involved, not just those with lived experience. Involving people with lived experience in an equitable and ethical way requires resources, time, reflexivity, attention to the underlying values and, principle, and principles, and crucially, the recognition that people you involve aren't just repositories of lived experience to be mined. Their needs and development require attention and resources too. Thank you. Lynn, that was fantastic. And I'm so glad we're recording this because that for me was a very powerful argument, not only in favor of all the reasons of the importance of lived experience, but also the dangers of getting it wrong. And, and um, uh, so many questions, but a really important ones and power, culture, emotion, values and reflexivity. Um, and really good point about that, you know, lived experience we need to think about the skills of people with lived experience just as much as, as anyone else. So thank you so much for that. And, and also you lead nicely into our, our next and, and final talk on deliberative demo democracy. And Kerry, maybe you want to answer some of those things on the performiv performivity, if I can even say the word. Uh, I was at Extinction Rebellion at the weekend, which is a UK campaign on climate change, and they had citizen assemblies there and it was fun, but it was there was no change of power, and I don't think there's real lived experience uh, on that. But Kerry, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Jonathan. And as with the other speakers, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and join in this forum, share a little bit about, um, hopefully, make a contribution and engage in a discussion. Um, I think certainly both of some of the things that Patrick and Lynn have said uh, are things which I was planning to talk about, sort of share from my perspective. Um, so I'll do that anyway and hope to be able to kind of pick up reflections um, on those questions and challenges as we go through. I think it's also worth saying, perhaps by way of introduction, that um, uh, I am not the face of all things deliberative democratic, and this is a, a kind of a, a large, wide and kind of multi-field and multi-sector kind of effort that I have a little corner of. Uh, so yeah, I, I suppose I'll try and sort of speak from that place and then see, uh, see how that intersects with some of these other kind of questions and uh, reflections. Um, so in terms of the question about how we could get lived experience to really influence national policy, I wanted to start uh, to say that I come at this question from a few different places. Uh, the kind of current role and the thinking that I do from where I sit now is informed from a, a sort of much broader journey through a number of different uh, kind of jobs and careers and forms of activism and volunteering that have spanned working in community development, both internationally and in the UK somebody who's worked in uh, research projects that have worked with mental health service users as peer researchers, and someone who spent time researching the ways in which different ways of knowing can be brought into dialogue with each other uh, to impact issues of social disadvantage. And I'm someone who now uh, does social policy research. So I want to talk a little bit about three main things, I think, which uh, sort of draw on that background and reflect on this question. Um, and the sort of central premise of what I'll discuss is the question of whether deliberation might be a promising approach um, for unpicking uh, and exploring how we really might move towards lived experience um, and influence at a national policy level, but also inevitably explore some of the problems and barriers that that might present. One of the things I'm also interested to do is reflect on whether there are parallels from other sectors, uh, particularly in the sort of community university research world, um, and whether there's anything there which can give us some clues about, um, about influence, impact and the integration of different sources of evidence. And then try and offer a little bit about what I think it might mean for, for some sort of next steps if we accept the premise of my arguments, which we absolutely don't have to do. <laughs> So uh, much of my work now is about national level dialogues and deliberations, formats and processes which are designed to engage citizens with policymaking. Uh, citizens juries, as Lynn mentioned, would be one, one example of those. Citizens assemblies, absolutely the same. Um, these are processes which are about exploring, informing or contributing to decisions which get taken on a wide range of policy areas. And they aren't just restricted to things that happen in the UK. We're seeing an increasing range of uh, initiatives and ideas that, that are, uh, are popping up globally uh, in many, many different places. Um, and in fact, many of the origins of a, a kind of doing democracy differently have actually come from Global South 
uh, places, including South America. So they're, they're slightly more recent, I suppose, in the UK context, um, but there are obviously some uh, some sort of shining examples of where deliberation in that sort of public policy space uh, come together. Um, and what I think our work both at Natsen and in this kind of wider field uh, has begun to provide for, although not without consideration, um, is where lived experience might uh, be part of these encounters in a number of different ways. So I just wanted to give you some examples from work we're doing at the moment. So we're about to start work with Shelter uh, on a national uh, citizen summit looking at the housing emergency. And one of the things we're doing as part of that deliberation is uh, is waiting or overweighting, make sure that we include a greater number of people with lived experience of the housing emergency than we do the general public in order to explore some of the questions um, and think about some of the, the sort of decisions and policy implications of, um, of that for the UK in the future. We've also worked with government on their biomass strategy running a public dialogue which involved over 100 people across the UK. Uh, but as part of that, there were uh, a specific number of those people who came from affected communities who already experience or live near um, or are in some way impacted by uh, the use of biomass, which is a which is an energy source which the UK are exploring as a way to reach sort of net zero uh, emissions goals. We've also worked with people who've got lived experience who to offer testimony into deliberative processes. And I think Lynn's point about sort of expertise and who gets to know in deliberation is, is really on the nose um, and very much something which I think about and is actually one of my problems on the list for, you know, is this a good idea and what does it offer us? Um, and we've also worked uh, not necessarily in an explicitly deliberative way, but with peer researchers um, on a project exploring the impacts of COVID-19 in certain local authority areas. So there's a range of different ways in which people have been implicated, if you like, um, and have taken on different roles and for different purposes in some of the research that we do, which is what I'm drawing on to, to sort of share some of these points. Um, Deliberation, of course, requires good conditions, um, which whilst lots of people spend a lot of their time thinking about what these good conditions are, perhaps is a prompt to alert us to what these actually need to be um, in the question of, of how it is that different forms of evidence might make their way towards policy impact. Um, and in the sort of wider deliberative democracy space, this includes things like processes having degrees of legitimacy, running with authenticity, uh, that people meet each other in respectful situations and uh, engage in civil forms of discussion. So these hallmarks that we're looking for in order to uh, generate and uh, situate forms of evidence. And so it tells us something about the participative conditions that might help engage and support different types of experience into processes and make them visible or more visible, shall we say, to policymakers. Uh, and the idea behind most of, <clears throat> excuse me, the idea behind most of these projects is that they have some kind of impact or relationship to policymaking. For example, the shelter work I mentioned will inform their manifesto commitments, which they'll be advocating on um, in, in an upcoming general election, whenever that might be in the UK. Uh, the biomass project findings were incorporated into the government's biomass strategy, which will be, pu which will be published. So we have some examples of where we can follow the input and engagement of the public but also specific communities and experiences into policymaking landscapes. And I think, again, this indicates some promising ideas about how we can treat lived experience evidence and its influence on national policy. But of course, this isn't without problems that present a series of barriers to how we can get real influence with national policy. Um, and here are just a few of them, and they're in no particular order. <laughs> Um, the first is that deliberation as a site for engaging with lived experience, I think, can really hit the buffers on what gets considered expertise. So very much speaks to Lynn's point. I was nodding vociferously when she was asking these questions. You know, who gets to know um, in these processes, and whose and whose knowledge, if, um, you know, whose knowledge is both incorporated, but also whose knowledge is considered um, evidential enough to be part of the uh, information which uh, which uh, participants engage with and, and think through. And of course, lived experience itself. Whilst it speaks to a, cate a category of knowing and evidence itself is not or shouldn't be seen as a homogenous category. Um, so I think, Lynn, you've you articulated that better than me, but at the point the point stands definitely on my problems list. The second one is about questions of validity, not least sample size. Small numbers of people get engaged in deliberative format in any one time. We have issues with scale and participation with respect to deliberation. And there are also questions of representativeness which follow. But also those questions of validity validity as it speaks to the sort of politics of knowledge, the, where we know that there are hierarchies of knowledge and evidence. Um, 
and uh, anybody who works in research will feel familiar with debates from you know qualitative and quantitative methods. So we might be at risk of running really good processes only to discount the outcomes or minimize the voices of, who, of those who participated. So whose knowledge really counts um, in deliberative efforts and what does that mean for this question about policy influence? A third problem, I think, is around accessibility and inclusion. So, and this has got two parts to it. There's a sort of practical part and a more sort of epistemic part, a more knowledgey part. So when seeking, exploring and working with lived experience, um, how can people both be present but also be heard? And the ways in which people talk about and represent their experiences uh, often gets uh, corralled or um, or greater weight gets given to it when it's being done in a way which is supposedly rational as a way to, uh, instead of ways that might be coming from a more emotional perspective. Um, and Patrick mentioned storytelling and exploring that as a means to, to both inform and, and kind of move evidence forward. And there's a lot of debate in the sort of broader deliberative world about whether we all need to, um, well, whether we all need to sit around and sort of justify our reasons, or in fact, whether there's different ways in which we express our experiences and that have uh, weight in terms of sort of evidence and evidence generation. And the final problem is what my colleague, the former Labour MP, Graham Allen, would call the political endgame. So um, if you don't have that worked out, if you're not sure who's buying into your process, if you're not sure what's going to happen with the potential outcomes of a deliberation, then potentially you fall very flat. And certainly in the UK context, we've had various examples, and indeed in some of my own work, where uh, work has been commissioned, it's very lovely, and then your classic report ends up on the shelf, which itself is a very undermining experience and perhaps uh, denies some of the sort of democratic potential, um, as well as the evidential potential of these processes. So I think what many of these boil down to is two main themes, which I think become the subject for me of sort of how could we tackle these in order to answer the question of influence. And one is that the relationship, I think, between participation and epistemic inclusion can't be assumed. And I think people often either don't look at that very closely or they sort of hope it'll all sort of come out in the wash. Um, so even the most best practice of processes can't influence national policy without carving out the routes to impact, which in deliberative efforts should always be something that happens at the start of the process and not the end of the process. And I think that's something uh, we often fall in, into. So there's some of the problems. Um, I think the other thing that sprung to mind when I was thinking about this is a related dimension to the question, which is around what might be ethical and equitable if we're to be working in and around spaces in these ways, uh, which perhaps speaks to the practices and conditions um, in which we're doing this sort of work. And I think that any effort that's concerned with redrawing some of the status quo in terms of knowledge and the evidence landscape, which, which um, thinking about lived experience and policy impact for me infers, brings with them ethical questions and it brings with them methodological questions. So I think in that sort of ethical and equitable box, you would always expect to see trust, reciprocity and mutual benefit being the basic building blocks of, of work that you would hope to do. Um, and learning from other sort of sectors and fields, there's a, there's a, there's a, a sort of field of work called care ethics or ethics of care. Um, which Joan Tronto, Marion Barnes and others um, have spent time on. And I look to that in this context of ethical and equitable, because they talk about how it is that you can research with care and what some of the dimensions of that are, taking responsibility for what you're doing, uh, the role of attentiveness, attentiveness in understanding who's involved in, in what you're working on and what's important to them, having degrees of competence, which again speaks to questions of identity for me, again, which Lynn began to raise around, um, you know, who do we see as doing what? And why is that important? And do we unpack that enough? And I think that what some of these things point towards and in some ways might be a counter to some of the problems and achieving some of the promise, perhaps, of a more uh, deliberative approach um, is drawing attention to the relationships and practices that sustain work that we do when we're when we're working with broad ranges of people in lots of different ways. And some of these might be evidence practices and some of these might be other things like the time we spend with each other or the roles different people implied in the evidence process are willing to play. Am I the researcher today, which means I have to come up with the questions or actually can it be me making the tea in order to facilitate a room of people to be making progress on the thing that they're looking at. Um, I also draw here a little bit more on some of my PhD research, which explored how diverse ways of knowing between people in the academy and people outside, so in universities and in community organisations, um, how those diverse ways of knowing can count towards how issues of social justice are both defined and addressed by research. 
So in this, I spent quite a bit of time thinking both about not just how spaces could be created for different ways of knowing to be generated, but also the challenges of integrating different types of evidence into findings and outcomes. And I think what this research showed is that a key factor is an awareness and a willingness to think about dialogues of knowledge. So the characteristics of relationships that did this well contended not just with the practical aspects of what enables or constrains people's participation, the time and resources that Lynn spoke about, but also to find adequate ways of incorporating different ways of knowing that can influence knowledge production. And as I'm saying all of this, I, I, I want to just introduce a note of caution on this idea of dialogues of knowledge. Uh, the aim for me in this context is that they operate to offer a greater range of evidence rather than replace or overthrow kind of like more traditional means. Different types of knowledge, of course, are appropriate to different functions and contexts. Um, the Belgian philosopher Isabel Stengers gives this example of the scientists in the laboratory. The laboratory? Yeah. That's how I'm saying it today, uh, where no other knowledge can, for instance, rival biology and what concerns the role of DNA molecules in protein synthesis. So when I suggest this idea of dialogues, it's more about imagining how a constellation of knowledge might be valuable on national policy problems and decisions, raising awareness of and contending with the legitimacy of evidence that comes from different sources. And of course, there's a series of implicit power, power dimensions in here not least who decides. So thank you, Lynn, you've covered some of that for me. And I don't have time to unpack that, of course, in 10 minutes. But the point I just want to emphasize is that I think we have to, I think we have work that demonstrates that a focus on dialogue, uh, that a more relational approach tends to promote is central to recognizing and incorporating other voices, perspectives, testimonies in answering and understanding some of the issues that might be at stake in policy uh, issues. So for me, the answer to the question, whilst that's a, a rambling little set of things to have a think about, is it's as much about paying attention to the practical arrangements and opportunities that we have as it is facing down the knowledge part of the equation, although they're very much entangled. So how do we do that? Well, I take some clues from some of the work I've mentioned, and I think some of the implications are, uh, I think there's some implication here about the need for more long term rather than short term efforts understanding that even if we're in resource or time poor situations what can we achieve rather than using that as an excuse not to do it or overlook it or rush past it so back to some of uh, that sort of ethics of care stuff um, i think prioritizing working out the end game at the start of the process becomes increasingly important if we're to think uh, credibly and think about the maximum use of everybody's time and valuing it um, in all ways rather than putting people through lots of processes and giving lots of effort and it not really going anywhere um, of course, I'm going to say commission more deliberation, uh, but I think actually it's more about making the case for policymakers, including the relationship that doing deliberative things, or they don't have to be citizens assemblies, they don't have to be citizens juries, uh, but they do have a relationship to get democratic legitimacy, and I think that's worth um, thinking a little bit more about in this context. But ultimately, I think it's about spending a bit more time thinking, um, time making our assumptions that's not at all what that says, and that doesn't make sense. Try that again. I think spend a bit more time uh, thinking about the assumptions that we make about all the inputs, not just lived experience that go into evidence processes. So we're really paying attention to uh, sort of research room research or uh, people who are crafting policy making processes and those who are inputting into it. Um, and ultimately, I think we should all be willing to make the tea. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Kerry. Can, can I... Um... Uh, I'm going to open it up in a moment to people to ask questions and just a reminder if you do have questions can you keep it really short so uh, I can uh, read it at the same time as 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 talking uh, and feel free to to share resources and Kerry actually if you've got anything on the ethics of care that you think are really worth reading do do share that but Kerry can I bring that challenge from from Lynn uh, I'd love to get your take on this that do you feel that some of the deliberative techniques are still quite a performance, a performative thing? Is that a fair critique of some of the things you've seen? This is being recorded, isn't it? Yeah, and it's going to go out on YouTube. I mean, I, I think it is fair. I think it's fair. I think you have to be open and reflexive in, in the ways that Lynn was calling for in terms of uh, what these processes offer and what they can achieve. I think there's also a risk, as with any form of participation, that especially when something um, you know, if I hear deliberative turn one more time in my in the stuff that I do, right? Um, 
and it doesn't I think sometimes people's keenness to be able to do these types of things doesn't catch up with the ways in which they should be done so I think there is a performative aspect and there's certainly the opportunity to co-opt many of these processes to make them um uh, to mask what might be kind of underlying issues I often think in these examples of um some of the work of um political scientist uh, Nancy Fraser who talks about um, whether what you're really doing is just rearranging the deck chairs in effect um, or whether you're actually really looking at the underlying conditions that are generating the sort of inequalities the need for change and the types of participation that might be required towards more kind of socially just outcomes so I often think about that dimension with respect to deliberation and I think there are some efforts that are doing the first one of those so just rearranging and making it look nice and then I think there are others which give us the opportunity actually to really contend with some of the underlying stuff um, towards what I would imagine to be more kind of just and appropriate um, ways of doing things. Thank you, Kerry. Thanks for a great presentation. I mean, it's something I'd like to ask all the, the delegates, and maybe we'll, let, we'll answer some of the audience questions first before answering this. But I know we have some people uh, in this call who are thinking of setting up some lived experience within the policy world um, uh, wearing government or NGO hats. If you had advice for somebody who wants to do it, I, I've heard from all of you some quite practical things, you know, including essential stuff like how you pay for it, as well as how to get the relationships. And you've all made a really strong case based for the practicalities as well as you know, core things like power and relationships. But if you were having advice on that, I'm going to give you a time to think about it. You don't have to answer straight away, but I'd like to ask all the, the, the speakers what tips you would have to getting policy to really get their lived experience right. So that uh, it is, for instance, not just the end of an end game, but actually a core part of it and authentic. So I'm just uh, priming you that I will come back to you to ask all three of you. But I wonder if I could um, try and summarize some of the really interesting questions. Actually, I think I'll go to some of the, the practical ones that are quite essential uh, for me. So, so there's one, and this might be where all of you've got um, a direct experience of, which is on disability and how we engage uh, with people with disability, which could be very broad. Uh, as you've as you stated, but when we're doing lived experience, have you got any advice on disability? Is anyone going to try and have a go on that first? Okay, I see you're nodding. Do you want to have you had a direct experience of disability? I, you mentioned we, the biomass and shelter. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's um, probably not quite in the way that the that would be sort of adequate to cover the question. I think that often. Um, we have to think about the sort of inclusion needs of people that we're working with or inviting into deliberative processes and that has uh, included a range of disabilities in the past one of the things we found actually after running some of our um deliberations online is that that's enabled the involvement of people who might otherwise find it difficult um, either through uh, sort of the way they have to manage their health care or through other forms of kind of access to come to like a hotel for a weekend say so I think that we've um, we sort of encountered it at that level and had to think a little bit about what it means and what we need to understand from people in order to try to make some of those processes inclusive what we haven't done so much about but I'm aware of is a current debate and actually it's a very interesting project at the moment that's happening uh, funded by UKRI which is the um, which is the UK research agency in effect um, looking at neurodiversity and forms of neurodiversity in uh, deliberative contexts um, and what that means for the way in which people speak with each other navigate evidence and ultimately kind of themselves have discussions so it's not something that we have done lots and lots on but uh, have some awareness of and um, yeah over and above that sort of rather basic level of inclusion which probably isn't quite enough um, I'd say ongoing. Yeah. Lynn. Yeah, I mean, I think the whole thing of disability and your perception of yourself as, as disabled or not really came up in our, in our shielding research because, you know, we spoke to people with um, who lived with um, autoimmune inflammatory disease and the conditions for the first time, you know, just they'd never really thought of themselves as disabled 
but, but the conditions. So I, I think there's something interesting there. But but also what, what, what I really wanted to say was there's something here about worlds. Mm -hmm. And in, for me to do what I do, I need to enter the research world or I need to enter the policy world. And I have learned how to operate in those worlds. And to me, real inclusivity of whatever type of, of, of disability or, 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 or types of, um, you know, whether you're neurotypical or, or neurodiverse is actually research and policy need to come into our world. And they need to meet us there in our world and they need to understand what's important to us in, in our world. And that, that will make it accessible. Yeah. <laughs> you know, not as always having to go into, into someone else's world and, 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 fit, in, and fit in there. And uh, Lynn, while I've got you, Pat, Patrick, I'm gonna come to you in a second, um, but just there's also a really uh, important question for some people who actually are new to this with lived experience. Do you have any advice, Lynn, about somebody coming into it new about how to get more involved? Um, so, so that's it. You know, I've been reflecting a lot that when I got involved at first seven years ago, I was just grateful to be involved. And then I moved beyond the, 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 the gratitude. And and it was it was actually really difficult for me to get involved. I mean, I hear people saying, oh, but we can't find people to involve. And I was really, really, you know, had to hunt out, had to hunt out opportunities. So I, what I would say to people that want to be involved is, especially in the start, you are going to have to invest in yourself and you're going to have to invest time and effort in order to find those opportunities because, because still I don't think people are coming out to... Um, to, to actively seek and, and, and it's changing but to work with communities and and to find people where where they are in, in order to to involve them and i you know, when i think of the time and effort that i've invested in myself over the over the years to, to get to, to get to, to where i am where i am now and i think that causes great problems because i am so conscious of my privilege and been able and been able to do that and that, that that creates so many problems mm -hmm. and is anybody providing training and support for people who lived the experience you mentioned the imposter syndrome is it so I, I think what what i have done it so i think the biggest thing that i have used is twitter mm. i would say about because it's I, I know that twitter's changed recently but in many ways it was a very very equal platform and, and you could in, engage in debate so but that was a lot of work and effort to build up my profile on Twitter. And then it's like Twitter becomes that work because you've got to be on there and, you, and you've got you've got to be active. So I'd say about 90 percent of the opportunities I have accessed is I mean, that's how I know it is, it is from it is from Twitter. Um, but but again, it, yeah, just. You know, it, it's it, when I think of it. Like I say, the amount of time and effort that, that I had to that, that I had to vote devote to, and 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 that that's just not that's just not equitable. It doesn't sound like at all. Patrick, can I ask you something slightly different? Unless you wanted to ask answer some of those questions, but um, you made a really strong case for the need to contextualise evidence, and I hadn't realised quite how many other global bodies you've worked with whether it's Joanna Briggs Institute or the Education Endowment Foundation in the UK, and it goes on. But there's a question about uh, the quantitative and qualitative and whether we need to find ways to bring those two together, because perhaps in the lived experience world, it's much more qualitative. If you're dealing with something like the Education Endowment Foundation, which uses uh, quantitative research from randomized control trial, do you have any advice about how we bring in that uh, qualitative lived in experience, Patrick? Yes, I, um, I think bringing in qualitative lived experiences is really critical to moving forward, um, especially so for my setting, uh, because bringing in this lived experience actually does two things. It, it enables us to better understand uh, the context we are working with, uh, the challenges that people face. And it also gives us an opportunity to prioritize because when we do 
the data collection for the from the focus focus group discussions or key informant interviews. We often usually do, do a Delphi consensus within a stakeholder engagement, where we bring all the stakeholders and we try to get their experiences with the intervention. And all of this is done in the pilot study. And I think at this moment, we have an agreement with the Education Endowment Foundation that this is a must. So the pilot study focuses a lot on the lived experiences and highlights uh, quantitative uh, outcomes that are promising within a pilot within a scale out or a randomized control trial, then we can go on now to uh, use this within our impact evaluation at scale. It makes the work easier to gather the lived experiences. Thanks. I hope that answers to an extent. You can still dig for that if. <laughs> yeah, I, I could I'd be delighted to dig deeper, but I've got so many other questions. I think I might actually go into another question while, I, while I've got you, Patrick, because um i wonder if you mentioned Del the delphi panel that you use which is a forum of trying to get a consensus where there isn't a consensus and if you have two different almost classes of lived experience so somebody who might have a disability who might have a uh you know disadvantage at socioeconomic how do you get a people who are not just privileged with lived experience maybe they got money or resource a little bit more capacity or institution to help them do you pay people or how do you make sure you've got even a diversity within that lived experience so um that's a very good question and i think it's very important to keep that in mind every time we gather lived experiences because the different stakeholders uh, at some point they need to come together uh, the different stakeholders also do not um may not be able to work together if you put them together, if you get what I say. For example, you could have policymakers on one hand uh, and citizens on the other hand, and you put them in the same room, and this could be a problem. Uh, so sometimes you have to know when to put them together and when to separate them. Unfortunately, there is no clear cut advice for this, but on sensitive topics, it's usually important to separate the policymakers from the citizens because some of the citizens may not maybe may be afraid to talk. So the cost, the high cost actually may come in bringing these people together, especially the people at the ministries, the people at government, because sometimes to get them to talk, you need to move them from the capital city and to another area, because if they're in the capital city, they come for the state. Patrick, I think we're going out or they keep, uh, or, they, or they are not picking. Uh, so this is, this is about the idea. Thank you. Sorry, Patrick, it was just there. Uh, the line was breaking up for, for a moment there, but th thank you for that. I've, I've got uh, some, some other questions for, for everybody and, and, um, and the panel. And feel free to put your hands up if you feel you're, you have a, an answer to it. It's quite a difficult one. It's like the, the, the sourcing of this and whether we can crowdsource some of this material. So for me, and correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of lived experience certainly when I've seen it would be about getting people in a room, getting in a journey. It might be a digital room, but are there other ways we can crowdsource and really open it up? And uh, Kerry, you might have insights on the sort of methodological rigor of doing that. But secondly, is there anything we can do with lived experience that creates a live legacy so it lives on so that you don't just have something uh that was for that particular moment but it's something that's captured for the longer term does any other panel want to try and answer those i'm sorry they're quite difficult questions but they seem important to me to it's looking beyond our normal ways of working like yeah i'm happy to give it a bit of a go i mean i think that for me makes me think a little bit more about how you increase uh how you increase opportunities for people to participate again principally with my deliberative hat on or, or thinking about um, deliberation more broadly. I mean, one of the things that makes me think of is, is a bit of work that we're involved in and others are working on at the moment around how you scale participation um, in deliberation and where crowdsourcing might indeed be one of the ways in which you could do that. One of the things that I often think about with crowdsourcing is what the purpose of that might be. So it goes a little bit back to some of the things that Lynn was raising and Patrick has raised around kind of type, types of evidence, but also when you're trying to generate it. So who gets to set the question? 
is often something which no one pays any attention to. I don't often in some of my work, if I'm completely honest, it's like, oh, this is the question I've got to answer. It's been given to me by this person or this policymaker. So off I pop, like, how do I make a good process out of this? So I do think that there's a lot of room here to use ideas of crowdsourcing as a way to try to understand what's important to people and what questions they'd even like to see answered, never mind the ways in which they then contribute experience towards that. Um, I think there's also something quite important with respect to that around how we already have lots of different platforms uh, that exist now in the kind of social media landscape, which is completely outside my realm of expertise, but where, where a conversation is already happening who already talks about the things that have salience and, or, and what are the ways in which they discuss them? And can that be, you know, there will be methods, there will be people who know how to do this stuff to be able to kind of map where certain debates or interests are um, in certain groups or within certain populations, which might also be sources that people should start to use, at least to try to get a sense of uh, what's being discussed. So I do think there's a role for that, uh, certainly. Um, that did make me think of something else I've now forgotten. So, uh, yeah, if any of the others want to crack at it while I try and remember. Um, yeah. It, it'll it's come back, back to you. Me. Yeah. Lynn, I don't know if you've got any thoughts about using other methods to maybe crowdsource uh, approaches. Kerry talked about, you know, using social media to watch things, but also creating a legacy so that the, ev the evidence we capture from the experience lives on. Yeah, I mean, I just kind of want to they go where go where people are, um, and it, so I, I think there's been a real problem um, in in research, and, and a lot of this is the culture that research operates in. It's not it's not the people working working within it. You know where we've kind of gone in, extracted lived experience, and then buggered off. It, you know, n n never to. And you know, people have ended up feeling quite quite exploited because a, a lot of this. So, so I think there, there is there a difference, isn't there, between sort of like crowdsourcing research ideas? You know, wh wh where does it start? You know, wh wh where does the research question um, come from? But also the process of doing that, which is is about you know building trusting relationships and actually just understanding that this is a relational way of working and it's built on relationships and conversations and collaboration whereas a lot of research and maybe policy is around more hard skills and outcomes it's, it's about grant funding and it's about publishing and uh, and whatever and just just understanding that that why people get involved are are different it's the way you treat people that are important that not everyone will want to get involved and actually that's okay because <laughs> because you don't because you don't have to but also that that actually a lot of people need do you need a reason to to, to, to become involved you know the way that just the recognition that the way that things affect you are are, are going are, are going to be different you know that that you might not understand all the issues unless you have this direct lived experience of it sorry that was just a word a word jumble it, it, it's it's just so context specific well, in a, I think it helped me remember the the sort of second part of what I was thinking Lynn which was actually whilst I think there can be a role for crowdsourcing or this idea of kind of opening up or trying to find greater participation that somehow comes into tension with many of the things we've been saying between us around around where that relational component fits so how do you navigate the tension of spending time with people, learning about what's important on all sides? And that's not a kind of researcher to other person thing. That's yeah. everyone who might be involved. Uh, what happens then when you try to sort of scale up and look at that sort of more mass level where you won't know people and you won't understand their motivations or drivers? But so I think there's a it just goes back to the point about context, which Patrick also started with in his presentation. So I was, doing, I was nodding along with that as well. So I do think that's an interesting thing to consider when trying to navigate a sort of maximizing of opportunity for want of another way of putting it. And then also how does that intersect with what we know works um, in kind of uh, good practice around the engagement of lived experience and its potential to influence policy. So I think perhaps it's a, as with many of these things, I think it's useful to think about the spectrum that you might be able to work across here where not everything has to be for everybody, but also not every method has to achieve everything. So if we're being a 
a bit more knowing and a bit more intentional about selecting the ways in which we want to work at different times. It's still imbued with all of the questions about who gets to decide what to do and what's important, but perhaps that's a helpful way to be thinking about where you have, you know, anything from the very personalised long term effort with a local area, local community or local group through to how can we use more uh, sort of general or, or things with wider reach in order to uh, give people increase the number of participatory opportunities people have. So that's a problem rather than a solution. But I think uh, it just brings to mind that need to distinguish and how that sometimes I think gets lost when we're kind of putting everything into the deliberative box, even or the, you know, yeah, so something in there. Yeah, I think, yeah, you're right. I mean, context is is so, so important. And I think sometimes we we think of we think of involvement as homogeneous and just the same as the ways we think of of people as, as, as homogeneous and they and they absolutely they absolutely aren't um and, and what what works in one in one situation ain't going to work ain't going to work for for another and th there's a there's a saying about co-production that it's a state of being not of doing and i think sometimes we, we concentrate in the doing you know it's like well, well how do i do it how do i involve people how do i find people you, you know, tell me how to do it, <laughs> you know, rather than actually, what do we need to be? What do we need to be as people? What do we need to, what relational skills do we need to bring in this in order to make, to make the most of it? You know, because it's not, it's not a tick box. It's not something that, that, that you can, that you can follow. It's emotional and it's, and it's messy. And, and, and that, that's good, you know, but we don't, we don't like emotions. We don't like messiness, do we not? In research and policy but that but that's what it's all about that's why people get involved and lynn that's such an important point I'm, i ask you at the end if you've got any advice about how you get into that state of being if you're a policy maker uh because you're right uh, certainly you've worked in bits of governments that messiness is is part of reality but I, i'll come to that later on patrick i, I wanted to ask you something about one particular context which is young people um if you've got any advice about how you deal with young people and children which has its own sensitivities and another very sensitive area how you deal with issues of sexual violence against women and girls uh, i don't know if you've got any experience with this but some questions aimed at you on specifically children and young people and violence against women and girls um, yes, thank you very much. So we have quite a rich experience with uh, working with children at policy levels and pushing evidence um, uh, into policy and practice and households, because we, especially for the young children, it needs to cut across these three levels, uh, policymakers, practitioners, and then the public. And uh, the way we do it, uh, if I start with um, with, the, with, the, with, the, with, with the, working with the policymakers, we engage the policymakers, and um, we, 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 we actually have a convention, a memorandum of understanding with a number of governments to ensure that uh, research that we conduct, especially uh, which will have an impact on children, the allied ministries that can push this evidence for children are actively involved. For example, Ministry, Ministry of Social Affairs, Ministry of Basic Education, we have a memorandum of understanding uh, with, with, with these ministries. And uh, it's been very interesting how much the approach we use stimulated policymakers to, to, to start calling for us to let us know uh, what they are interested in seeing research in. And in that process, you get to understand their lived experiences, why those didn't work, and how you can improve this and it's it's, it's actually at that point more more friendly atmosphere of working uh, because sometimes there's always this bipolar relationship between the policymakers and the researchers and uh, then this also links to our sexual and gender-based uh, uh, project that we are doing where we use storytelling and there our approach what we have really learned is that getting the research to the people in the language that they understand and uh, in the format that they can easily digest is very important. A good example is when you look at the forest plots from a systematic view, you ask yourself, even as a scientist, you may need to do some more referrals to really understand it. But we have a powerful group of, of storytellers whom we have built their capacity <coughs> to understand these research findings. And some of these storytellers are 
traditional storytellers who are not even uh, educated. So we can help them through the process. And then they can now tell the stories to the community members. And these are still stories built from lived experience, but now have been sandwiched with evidence of what works. And then this is now pushed to the population. And sometimes, for example, if I look at sexual and gender-based violence, we did two things. We got a youth member of, uh, two youth members of parliament into the, the, the fight against SGBV and mitigation and pushing people to go for hospital after a rape. But we also trained children to sing a song, a very short song of about five stanzas, but which uh, makes them aware of, uh, makes it possible for them to identify sexual and gender-based violence, make them know where they should run to if they sense any sense of sexual and gender-based violence. And because these kids are always singing these songs in schools, in, the, in their homes, the perpetrators or those who are predating little children are already on guard and careful. And we've actually conducted a pilot project for this, which really shows that the acceptability is very high. And the preliminary pilot evaluation shows that there is possibility for us to have uh, an impact uh, for, for, for this approach. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. I was, um, we're really running out of uh, time now. So unless anyone else has um, burning questions uh i did want a final opportunity for the speakers to say uh any final points particularly my original challenge as well i do know there's some people in the audience who might not have asked a question who are either in the early stages of thinking about this or up and running projects either in the policy field or the ngo field i see there's quite a few funders as well uh, who've signed up um but if there are is any advice that you would have? And, and Lynn, it might give you going like, how do you become the beat? How do you become this? Not just about the activities, but if you had any advice and tips for those policymakers or NGOs who are thinking about generally doing lived experience, if you had any tips on that, um, I would love to hear all three of your thoughts on, on that topic. Yeah, so I, I've. So I've, I've written down three things and it just reminds me, so I was involved in a wonderful piece of work with the Co-Production Collective. It's the value of co-production um, research project, which was multiple methods, but um, I was involved in the rapid systematic review. And one of our biggest finding was, is the journey as important as the destination? And I think sometimes we become so outcome focused. And actually, when we work together, it's the journey of working together that, that's just as important. So be, bear that in mind. Don't just concentrate on, on what your outcome is. I think that you need to understand, and, and I find this, you know, when I was putting together my presentation today, there's a very fine line between being a bit challenging, but being perceived as so challenging that no one wants to work with you. And I, I think that that's something to, to keep in mind for, you, you know, for policymakers, how, how are you going to cope with, with challenge? And the final thing I would say is, you know, we hear a lot about involving lived experience, whether it's definitely in research and increasingly in policy. And it's like, can everyone wants to do it because everyone's expected to do it? But I would say, don't do it if you can't embody the values, because actually you can cause great harm. Mm. And, and it's just not fair to. So if you can't do it, then leave it to someone else. But that's why you need to be really reflexive and ask yourself, can I work in a values and principles led way? to involve people meaningfully in a, in a, in a way that, that, that they want. And if you can't understand, have enough insight to understand that you can mm -hmm. and leave it to someone else. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, one just purely practical stuff, you mentioned in your, your earlier talk about the importance of paying uh, for people's time. Uh, how much should that be? <laughs> I mean, it's a really practical one, but but it, uh, there's been some other chat about that and some suggestions. What should yeah. we be paying? I know that's plucking numbers out in the, the air and what might be different in Cameroon to, to Scotland to everywhere else, but what was your advice? Yeah, on so, so I think that the National Institute of Health Research has made it easy in the UK because the, the, there, are, there are recommended rates. But what, what I would say, what I would like to say on on payment is how I have been made to feel by people in well-paid, secure jobs for asking 
for, for, for payment for my insight and whatever. I'd be made to feel that I'm greedy. Um, I was in the situation, something that, that the Scottish Government asked me to be involved in, in, in rare disease, and it wasn't paid. Okay. I asked for digital expenses, and I was told that they would decide, and that I was trying to ask for something that every, because it, it, because everyone had everyone had Wi-Fi, and, and everyone had the hardware and whatever to enable them to thingy um, digitally. And it, you know, but yet on the other hand, they go on about how inclusive and diverse they, they want to be. So. You know, I think what Maya Angelou says, you know, like people forget what you said and what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And that just made me feel really crap. And, and I just, you know, I, I thought to myself, I need to value myself. If I don't value myself, then other people aren't going to value. And it's, and often the only power we have is the power to walk away from situations like that and from people who think it's okay to treat us in that. In, in that way. Thank you, Lynn. That's a really important challenge there. And thanks, by the way, for everyone else who's been sharing some really valuable resources in the chat function, including on uh, things like the guidance on employment status and so forth. Uh, Patrick, can I come over to you? Imagine uh, for our policy colleagues on this call, what would advice would you have for them? Okay, so my advice would be there. Um, first, there's no need to, to, to reinvent the wheel and uh, that it's important um, to contextualize when there is that possibility. Uh, at eBase, we actually developed a mathematical tool that can help with prediction for transferability of research evidence from one context to the other, which allows us to know if we should contextualize or we should adopt uh, a research finding. And then I think collaborations are very important. We see a lot of collaborations going on in the world of music. I mean, one actor collaborates with another actor and immediately propels them and brings them to the limelight. I think in the field of evidence-informed decision-making, we need to start buying this concept. Uh, and then I also want to say something like for the funders, it's important to also highlight the fact that the field should be fair. Uh, for example, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has an approach where they actually get the southern researchers on a process of preparing for the grants and then they protect them in that process. This is something that could be very useful. Thank you. Brilliant, Patrick. And um, Kerry, you've got the final word. Thanks. OK, so um, also three things. I think the first is about confronting the status quo. Um, so we've always done it this way. That's nice. There's opportunities to do things differently. But I think you actually have to grapple with that and, and, and be able to unpack some assumptions and be prepared to have some of those conversations. It's very much a version of what Lynn and Patrick have said. Um, I think breaking silos of practice, I think the chat shows just, you know, even just through our conversation, how many different people from different places are working on analogous efforts. Um, and so I think there's value in, in attempting, although how you do it, don't don't ask me, but I think it should happen. Uh, and I think the third thing is about being bold. I think that I think that people in policy making or funding positions have actually got the opportunity to move practice on. Um, and I think they've got the opportunity to kind of create the conditions to uh, address uh, some of these questions and, and and kind of put put power and energy behind sort of opening up new possibilities so they'd be my three great three thank you so much i'm really glad i asked that question actually to put it on the stop spot um, and we've only got a couple of minutes left but i was going to hand over to uh, annette now to say some uh final words and thanks Thank you, everyone. So firstly, a massive thank you to our speakers. That was such a rich, I was trying to tweet, but I lost the energy in my fingers. <laughs> so many interesting contributions. Um, so really value, as Jonathan said at the start, having these opportunities to bring together different perspectives. And it, it's a lot of brain work for So we're asking quite a lot of the speakers and the audience when you're hearing people talking from such different perspectives. And so thank you for your engagement and for the great resources and ideas people have been sharing in the chat. That's where I get a lot out of meetings in addition to hearing the speakers. Um, and to Jonathan, so thank you for your chairing and keeping us to time. That was really excellent. Um, please do, if you want to share the, when we put this up on YouTube, share with people you think might be interested or also obviously that's an opportunity to comment and or to go to our website and we're also always interested in if people want to write blogs around this kind of areas so as a way of sharing ideas then please get in touch with us um, as that and another way of, of kind of sharing um your thoughts on this topic 
or to access some of the resources on the website and we try and keep up to date with with interesting and new ideas and things that people are doing in this area so thank you so much to everyone for all your engagement with this topic and this is definitely something we will return to it's something we're really interested in in transforming evidence so thanks everyone and have a good afternoon evening wherever you are bye bye